we were in a, in a in a really bad hotel called the Petroleum Hotel, which sounds which was as nice as it sounds. Every day we'd go down to the Mahakbarat at this little office they had in this dusty desert town. I'd say, can we go into Iraq? And they'd go, no. I got bored, so I built a boat out of lorry inner tube tires, lashed it together with rope in my hotel room, folded it, rolled it up, and at midnight, myself and two others loaded it into our fixer's car, got to the river, the Tigris, to, to try and paddle across into Iraq. The Syrian army saw us, popped a few shots off and chased us down the river, eventually caught us, <laughs> brought us back to this little outpost where they interrogated us for a few days. And then they let us go, eventually. And uh, I got back to the hotel and all the other journalists were like, you've spoiled our war, they're not gonna let us across now because of what you've done. And so I was like Billy No Mates in the, the hotel bar, just drinking at midnight it was. And the door opens and silhouetted in the, the, the light of the hallway is Marie. And she just stands there and she goes, who and where is the boatman? And I was like, and she just strolled across and she goes, boatman, I like your style. Marie Colvin, Sunday Times, can I buy you a whiskey? And I was like, yes, you can. And that's how we met. And I think that, that kind of set the tone for our future work and relationship. You know, she always called me boatman, you know, until the, until the day she was killed. We went in with our eyes wide open. We, we knew it'd be difficult, but you know, it's the kind of story that you don't just let slip by because it might be a little dangerous. I'm here about 10 kilometers from Homs with a unit of the Free Syrian Army. It's a difficult situation. These guys are now protecting the rural area of Homs from attacks from the Assad Brigade and to create a small safe haven where the wounded people can be brought out of Homs, treated, and also as a pipeline for getting medical food supplies into Homs. The story was in Homs, in a place called Baba Amra. Um, we knew that there were a lot of civilians trapped there, and it was encircled by the 4th Division, commanded by Bashar al-Assad's brother Maha. We'd, we'd just spent, I think, about eight months, seven, eight months in Libya. We came out of Libya late in the year, and then Obviously, Syria was just starting to, 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 to come on the radar. The scenes are unprecedented, day after day of protest. Syrians now demanding what Tunisians and Egyptians have just won, and Libyans are currently fighting for, wholesale political reform. Immediately, it was completely different from, uh, from Libya. In Libya, there was always a, a kind of zone that was occupied by rebels where you could fall back to. In Syria, it wasn't. When you went into Syria, you were immediately in regime territory and there were, there were no safe houses, there, were, there was no relaxing. Somebody said to me before I went into Syria, it was a Syrian, they said, look, in Syria, for every friend, you have a hundred enemies, meaning that the security services were so embedded in their culture that be careful who you talk to. It took us three days to travel about 30, 40 miles at night in the backs of trucks, on the backs of motorbikes. And eventually it culminated in a journey, a three mile walk through a, a storm drain that was about four foot high. So we were bent double. It was, there was virtually no oxygen because they'd been running a motorbike up and down the tunnel. That was to get all the ammunition, medical kit in. All supplies, all food went through this tunnel. And that was the only way for civilians to get out. And when we arrived in Baba Amra, it was, it was under full, it was a medieval siege, similar to what we're seeing in Mariupol now, there that's surrounded. And Assad's forces were just leveling it. <laughs> to get that story, you had to be there, which, which made every trip with Marie, um, you know, quite, quite a dangerous affair because to be there to get the story, you had to go through these ob series of obstacles and when we were there it was, it was the most intense thing I've ever seen and Marie, Marie said to me within a couple of hours of being in this is the worst I've ever seen and I'd never been under that level of systematic bombardment 
which made working incredibly difficult. You know, if there were snipers on every rooftop. There was 24 hours a day shelling. So running between buildings, getting to these little pockets of civilians was, you know, was the hardest thing we've ever done. Well, we finally got into Homs last night. Um, it was quiet during the evening, but this morning about 7 a.m., the shelling started, and it's been pretty continual ever since. We're just with a family who had um, who have moved from one house. They've been bombed out, and are now refugees living in one room. There's about eight people, by the looks of things. The bombardment got heavier. The conditions got worse. Um, till in the end, we decided on a Tuesday that we were not going to be able to file stories by Friday. That's generally when we filed. We knew it would be too late by then. Most of the people who brought us in were injured or dying or had been killed. And so we made the decision to, to do a piece on. We did BBC, we did Channel 4, and we did CNN. And after that CNN piece, um, where we talked about the baby dying that had been wounded by shrapnel in the stomach, that was our last plea to the world, really. That was our last chance to say, you know, do something, stop this insanity. Unless the world, in, you know, steps in, this is just going to get worse. And then six hours later, two rockets landed, and I'd say about 100 meters either side of the, the building we were in. Then 30 seconds later, another two explosions, this time no more than 50 meters away you know, just rock the building. And at that point, I realized that what was happening, they were bracketing. This a system of selecting a target, and they were monitoring with a drone. And then they'd adjust the fire, and then 50 meters closer. And I, at that point, I thought, we have about 30 seconds before they, they dial in, and the next, the next attack comes. And Sure enough, 30 seconds later, Marie was just about to leave the building with Remy Oshlik, a young French photographer who'd made it in that night. Um, and there was a lot of confusion. There was The building had been hit a couple of times. The roof had come down, the walls had come down. And then, boom, there was an, an almighty explosion took the back of the building out. And split second later, another rocket landed pretty much on the doorstep of the building where Marie and Remy were. Um, and they were killed instantly. And they, that brought the front of the building down and the floors above it. Um, I was, I didn't realize I was hit. I'd kind of, I'd felt something bang my leg. And uh, so I checked, put my hand, and my hand just kind of went inside my leg and came out the other side. I had a hole about yay big going straight through my leg. Shrapnel came in there hit and came out at the back. So I put a tourniquet on um, made, with my scarf, wrapped it around my leg, and I went to look for Marie and Remy, um, but I fell over them basically. My leg gave way, I fell over them, and I was in the rubble next, and I could see that Marie and Remy were both dead. So I was kind of laying in the rubble with Remy and Marie, and then I looked and there was like an almighty pool of blood around me. And I realized the tourniquet wasn't working. So I grabbed uh, an old ethernet cable that had been blown, blown out of the room, grabbed that, wrapped it round, and wound it up until I could see the bleeding had stopped. And then about 15 minutes later, they dragged me into what was left of the building. They gave me a cigarette and said, you okay? And I was like, yep. Yeah. And they, uh, Eventually they put me in a truck and took me to the field clinic, the field hospital, the room. It wasn't really a room, it was basic, basic, basic first aid stuff that the doctors had to work with. Where they kind of got a toothbrush and a bottle of iodine and pumped it in my leg, gave it a scrub. And then because they had no stitches, they stapled it up with an office staple gun. Shrapnel shattered Conroy's left leg and he was losing blood. Doctors at a makeshift field hospital bandaged him up. And then they put us in a room where we stayed for five days. And, you know, at that point, we knew the regime were deliberately targeting the buildings. Uh, you know, when I, when I look back at this, it was an attack. It fitted none of the patterns we'd seen. Normally the shelling was random. This did what it was meant to do. It was like the steps into hell 
Marie was dead, Remy was dead, we were badly injured. The tunnel we crawled through to come in had been blocked by an explosion and it took them five days to clean it, to, to make it big enough to escape through. And I think it was on day six, they took us through, back through the tunnel, or they got me through the tunnel. And then it was about another four days of, um, of traveling across Syria and my, my leg was getting infected and smelling and I was on the back of motorbikes most of the time. So by the time I got out into Beirut, I was just hanging in. They brought the, the bag in of the, the equipment that they managed to salvage from the rubble. And, and it was Remy's camera in particular that when I saw it, somebody suggested that we take it back and give it to his family as a, you know, a kind of memento or you know, something that Remy had used on, in that period. But it was, it was, it was turned, it was titanium and magnesium and really strong, you know, you, these things are difficult to destroy for a reason. But this thing looked like it had been turned inside out. It was just a piece of shrapnel had gone through it and just, it was like a cauliflower. It was mushroomed out and it was just a, a lump of expensive twisted metal. And I was like, you cannot give that to his family. You just can't do that because if they see that camera and they think, good oh God, you know, it did this to that camera. You know, what, what the hell did it do to, to their bodies? The bodies of American journalist Marie Colvin and French photographer Remy Oshlik have been handed over to foreign diplomats. They were killed in the shelling of homes 11 days ago. What was the most significant photo that survived that you can look back on and look at? It's the last photograph of Marie when she was alive, I think. You know, I did, I did get that out. It's, um, it's a picture of Marie in a place called the Widow's Basement. Um, and it wasn't a bomb shelter by any stretch of the imagination. It was an old woodworking factory that was built underground, and that's where all of the women who'd been, who'd lost their husbands or their sons or their menfolk, they kept them as safe as they could from the shell and in this woodworking basement. And I, rem I remember Marie was just working, and I kind of, when you got a lot of people, especially kids, the moment you show up with the camera, you change the scene. You know, they see the camera and they all start jumping about and, and doing this. So I kind of allowed Marie to go into the basement and was just interviewing people without the fuss of having a camera there. And it was just one shot I saw Marie and I kind of got in a slightly long lens on. So I just got this shot of Marie with about six people around as she was working in the widow's basement, which was, a, which was her last and greatest report. So that one photograph which I got out, you know, that was this the standout picture for me. It was Maria's last, inter you know, last, last time I captured her. But it was also her strongest story, you know, and that's, I think, Sean Ryan at the foreign editor agreed on that point. It was her finest piece of work. So to just that one image that survived was, was good enough for me.